The European champions came to town and left with a 2-1 win, but for 17 incredible minutes, the unlikely looked like it could actually happen. I'm joined by James Cunliffe to reflect on Luton Town 1, Manchester City 2. Shall we get into it, James? Yeah, go on then. Here's the intro. Welcome along to another episode of the Luton Town Supporters Trust podcast. As said before the intro, we're reflecting on Luton Town 1, Manchester City 2. I'm Kev, your host as always. I've got the Lutonian journalist James Cunliffe alongside me to look back on the game. James, it's another one of, oh, what might have been. Yeah, but like you said in that intro for 17 glorious proper football minutes, uh, the world was ours, wasn't it? <laughs> it absolutely was, yeah. I mean, second time in 21 months. Luton have been ahead of the European champions and uh, ultimately their class is told in the end. Um, let's go right to the start then, as always, as we always do. Team news, it broke on the fir- on the Thursday, on the Saturday, that Erling Haaland wasn't going to be in the Manchester City lineup, which gave us probably a 1% chance after, uh, as opposed to a 0.5% chance of winning <laughs> the game. Um, it's not like they brought Sunday league players in, is it? You know, it's just a World Cup winner that's gone and replaced him up top and and everything else. But the Luton team selection, three changes. I think we all expected one. Well, we had to have one change, didn't we? We all expected Doughty to play down that right-hand side instead of Kabore. That happened. Ryan Giles coming in, though, that was a bit of a surprise. Uh, we had Tom Lockyer back and we had Marvellous Nakamba back, which was good. Um, how did you see the, the sort of team selection? I guess Giles is the real surprise one in, in amongst all of that. But just, obviously Osho wasn't fit. I think Mads Anderson was just on the bench purely to decorate it. I don't, <laughs> don't think he was on there with any sort of hope of playing particularly long. He was there in case we were leading with five to go and you put everyone back or something like that, wasn't it? But good to see Giles play, but particularly good to see Marv back. Yeah, I mean that's essential. I think Marv to be back, it just it felt more. Uh, you felt more solid, and you felt more like you could do a job against them, knowing that they'd have the ball for. I mean, I was keeping an eye on the possession count for a little while, and I I tweeted out at the time, Luton have just ticked into thirty percent possession because for a while uh, they didn't give the ball to Luton, especially straight after kickoff, and you're like, oh, um, and so you're going to need players like Marv. In, in that situation and yeah, I mean, for the, for the first half bar, like um, one or two sort of chances, it felt quite solid really and didn't really feel under too much threat despite all that possession. I think they defended very well uh, and, I, I, you know, you've got to say that Marvel's a massive part of that, I, I think. And um, yeah, it's good, good to have him back. Also good to have Sambi on the bench as well. I know he came on later, but I think that those two being fit is really going to, you know, if we're if we're crowing over Ross Barkley now, I think those two fit and Barkley with more freedom, it's going to be a a mouthwatering prospect. Yeah, fear not. We will not go through this podcast without crowing about Ross Barkley again. <laughs> yeah. um, it's just going to happen. It's going to happen in every podcast. I'm sure you're used to it, and I'm sure you're fully expecting that. And we'll also cover the negative side of Marvelous's. Um, appearance uh, later on in the podcast but it kind of took us 15 to 20 minutes to get to grips with them didn't it I, whether that's the fact that we'd done all of our training because of, for Harland and then obviously had to completely rework it on the hop so to speak or the, the, just the fact that they're damn good and they had a point to prove given that their form and stuff but 15 or 20 minutes in and, uh, and even then they haven't overrun us have they they've had I mean, they did not give us the ball one little bit. I mean, like how we got 30% of it, I've no idea. But um, <laughs> It was later in the half. It was much later in yeah. the half. I mean, obviously, they nearly took the lead with Phil Foden in about first 75 seconds. Good save from Kaminsky. Thankfully, Bernardo Silva's radar wasn't as accurate as it was later in the game for the rebound. But then after sort of 15 or 20 minutes, everyone knew who their man was. We kind of matched them up, didn't we? We worked out who was who. We And we kind of... 
I don't want to say stifled them because that that would be the wrong word, but we we kind of managed them pretty well. Rodri had a long range shot that you know Kaminsky could catch, but obviously he's on telly, so he wants to push that away in fine style. Uh, Foden had another shot, which had to be fair to Kaminsky, made an absolute blinding stop. Luckily, it bounced straight back into his arms as well. Yeah, beautiful rather that, than, yeah. Rather than go out, but that aside. They didn't really get in the box much, did they? And you used to see Man City get down the byline, cross the ball, four or five people are waiting and someone gets a tap in. At no stage was that looking likely. No, and I think that that was part of the game plan, really. They did pack the uh, the centre of the park quite well and left left some space on the wings, um, knowing that Doku, who also didn't play, and we we were talking of how you might be able to stop him, He's a he's a wingman. He'll get down the down the flanks and down to the byline and try and cross it. But Grealish will run down there to an extent. Then he likes to come inside. So that's a, you know he played very well. Don't get me wrong. I, I think um, quite frankly how he doesn't get in the England side. Him and Foden, if they don't get in the starting side for England, is is why we will never win anything because they, they did not give the ball away. In fact, Phil Foden gave the ball away once and I tweeted, I was there when I saw him miss place of pass because it was that remarkable. He was so um, clinical with everything he did. But um, yeah, I think that packing out the, the centre of the park and keeping it tight in there made a difference. I mean, they still passed rings around Luton at certain points and pretty triangles and stuff, but um you can only do that so many times, I guess, until somebody gets a boot in and that seemed to be what was, what was happening. But yeah, I think it, it was a good tactic that, and I think you're right that once they, once the, the initial sort of blast of them go in full throttle, which you know, it was a sight to behold, um, they, they, they did sort of come to terms with it a little bit. And yeah, I, I, even despite, even after the goal, we should take the goal out, sorry, I think that they finished the half better. Than, than City perhaps so um, it was it was promising in that way yeah it really was uh, I mean I think we've seen every everything this league's got to offer now and if there's a better player in it than Phil Foden well I haven't seen him maybe obviously Erling Haaland but he's only a striker isn't he as a as a as a creative playmaker if there's better than Phil Foden in this league I'm not sure I want to watch him certainly not against us I hope he's injured that day because he was absolutely sensational. One minute you think you've got him and then he's flown off into a different direction. His passing, his first touch, everything about him. The reason why we want to be in the Premier League is to watch our players going up against world-class talents and there ain't many better world-class talents than him. Like you say, yeah. if Southgate doesn't pick him for the Euros, then I do. I mean, he's just got to pick Foden and Bellingham and nine others and go yeah. and win the Euros, and he's B- simple. Build as. the team around those two. Well, I mean, Kane as well. He's a, he's a forward. Build the team around him, and, and yeah, it's, it's baffling to me. He's, he's he's clearly a wonderful, wonderful talent. And what I saw at Kenilworth Road was quite astonishing. Um, his his movement and everything, his first touch, his decision making, his uh, eye for a pass through the lines and couldn't get the ball off him even in tight spaces it was unbelievable and um yeah I mean all of that was to really be admired by uh <clears throat> Man City uh Rodri as well was particularly good at that as well um I did find though after the initial period of watching them do that it's, it's odd to say because I was both in admiration of how they can play football all of them and how good they are at football of course they are they're gonna be they're multi-million pound players but it eventually it just became quite boring like wonderful technique but boring I actually said the exact same thing to the person who sits next to me this is wonderful to watch but mm. then I get boring after a while and and it was I mean they just wouldn't give us the ball back would they I mean it was like lads if you want to keep that one give us another one so that we can, <laughs> so that we can play but play we did we got, you know, we got kind of got a foothold. We got a little bit of confidence into uh, into the game. I think Townsend had a shot, didn't he? That was straight at Edison. Um, we mentioned, didn't we, in the preview podcast that he likes a pot shot against this lot. And uh, when that left his foot, I thought, go on then. But it didn't. Uh, straight it, down. It, it dipped throat. and swerved, but Edison was well placed. It was not, it was far enough out for him to get the measure of it just about. But it was a decent shot. But that was kind of um, the starting point of, you know, us getting a, sort of foothold in the game because it was very evident that if there was one player on that pitch not up to the standard of the rest of them it was Josep 
Guardiola left back. He just looked like a fish out of water, which is fair enough. He's a centre back playing left back, and we've seen it ourselves that it's not an easy transition to make. And the longer that the half went on, we we started to target that. Townsend became more in the game, and then you know half times approaching, and I guess on a Sunday afternoon or Sunday, we're all traditionalists would have a Sunday roast, wouldn't we? So it was only fitting that Barkley roasted their midfield. <laughs> and um, well, three of them thought they'd get the ball off him, didn't they? Bernardo Silva was the first one. No, 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 son, I'll turn away from you. Rodri came along. No, you're not getting it either. Rolls it into Alfie Doughty and then we're away. Gives it to Townsend and you're just like, you can see Brown hairing into the middle. You can see Eli hairing into the middle. Pick the right cross. It was an absolute peach of a cross go and head that in Eli and he did not make any mistake absolutely beautiful football goal he got called old fashioned on match of the day and I'm like well call me old fashioned then mate because (laughs) (laughs) that was a stunning sight everything about it and even when it got hung up by um, Townsend and you saw Eli going for it you thought he's got this even before he jumped and when he did he was like about two foot higher than the City players to, to get it and that's a, it was a glorious goal. Obviously started by Barkley. I mean, I don't know if anyone's noticed Townsend out, out on the radio duties today, um, this morning, calling him like Diego Maradona. That's his nickname at the training ground, isn't it, Maradona? I'm pretty sure before Diego passed away, he had posters of Ross Barkley on his wall, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it, it was kind of like that. It, it, I see where he's coming from. In the the goal, the legitimate goal he scored against us in '86, he rolled a, past a couple of England midfielders just like Barkley did in that, and you can see the comparison. Yeah, I think he's got a way to go to 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 be like Diego, but you know, you take the compliment, and um, it was yeah, it was wonderful. I mean, he's been doing that for a month now, Barkley, um, and if he can do that against the likes of Rodri and Bernardo Silva, there was another one in the mix as well, and the third one. I, I can't remember. Yeah, the, the third one that came in was um, the other centre-half, wasn't it? Not Diaz, but the other one, I can't remember who it was, who started for them. Uh, no, sorry, not centre-half. Kyle Walker was closing in on him. And um, what I like about Barkley, amongst the many things I like about Barkley, though, is he wants to make sure everyone gets a piece of the action. So he'd done Bernardo Silva and Rodri for that bit. And then in the second half, he thought, come on then, Foden and Kovacic, you can have some as well. So he turned away from Foden, didn't he? Body swerved his way past Kovacic without actually touching the football and then just unleashes the shot that's inches wide. If that had gone in the bottom corner, then Diego Maradona is definitely uh, part of the uh, the discussion because the control he's got on his of the ball at his feet is like something I've not seen. And he's not looking at it. He's looking ahead and in front. He just knows where it is. It's mm. like it's symptomatic. It's, it's automatic. It's it's fantastic. And it allows him to glide past world-class footballers. And I've said it again. I don't know what you was doing at Goodison Park, Gareth, yesterday. You could have watched six of your England squad at this game. And um, if you don't take Ross Barkley to the Euros, you're not doing it right. You're really not. He is in sensational form. He is. And, um, you know, to be the man that started off that move for the goal was um, very fitting for how he's been playing of late. And and quite rightly, he's been getting rave reviews for that one move in particular. And even the, the shot that you mentioned there, that was a fantastic uh, solo run as well. But to have that as a highlight reel for the goal, which was just oh, chef's kiss, gorgeous. It was, I, I, you could sense it. I don't know if, um, I'm not massive egg chasing fans, but one thing I do like about rugby is you can sense a try come in and it takes a long while, there's a long build up to it, but you can sense when it's happening sometimes. And they're the best ones for me. And this one felt like that. You can, that's a great move. Pass down to Doughty. Get that over to Townsend quickly, son. Did. That's a good option. If you can get a ball in the box, we've, we've got a chance here. And everything about it was absolutely perfect. And then, um, yeah, the, that noise was sensational noise when that went in. I was, I couldn't believe it. And um, uh, what what a moment for for Eli, for Luton Town, um, for football in general. Um, you know, I'm not going to hide away from the fact. I'm, it's enough. The, the, the Man City players aren't to blame for uh, the the current alleged charges that Manchester. City, to Manchester City face 
they they're there and they're getting as much money as they possibly can from from their owners but um you can't get away from the fact that you know their 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 away fans were singing we've won it all and the Luton town fans bit back and said no you've bought it all um which I thought was you know very fitting and you you can't get away from from this and to to go in at the break because you knew that was pretty much the last kick of that half one nil up against the European champions that have won everything, knowing the other stuff that we talked about in the preview podcast, the stuff that's hanging over their heads and what could possibly happen to them and what has happened to Luton in the past and how Luton run themselves now. Two opposite sides of the spectrum and to have that, firstly a football moment, a goal, wow, and then the sort of the background to it, the context to it was like, it was just sweet. Yeah, that goal was a dish that even Jamie Oliver would have been proud of cooking up, wouldn't it? It's, <laughs> it was fantastic. Uh, the irony is, you're right, Manchester City have brought it all. But the what, the best player on the pitch was the one they didn't spend anything on that's come through their youth system. It's, you know, and that's Phil Foden. It's, it's just, yeah, I, I guess it's the way of football. But you're right. I mean, the noise when that ball hit the back of the net and, and you're right. You just you could tell the path of the ball was going right on Eli's head, and you know, after Tuesday night, he wasn't missing it, was he? He was, you know, going to thump it in the in the back of the net, and for the second time in twenty one months, as I say, Luton lead the European champions in first half injury time. Ironically, the guy who put us ahead the last time, uh, Harry Cornick, was in the crowd hearing uh, Luton fans telling Jack Grealish that he's a poor Harry Cornick <laughs> for much of uh, the game. And um, I saw Harry Cornick after the game. I said a quick hello to him. He was having a natter. But um, yeah, it's good, good to see him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's good. Well, it's good to see all of the former players when they come back. And, you know, everyone who's been to any away game this season, most likely to have seen Glenn Ray at some point. And Jordan Clark's been in the away end whilst he's been injured. So, uh, yeah, it just goes to show that just because they've left doesn't mean that the feelings about Luton have left. Absolutely not. No, I think they still love the club, and um, you know that that you could say that was the best period of Harry Cornick's career, considering what's happening with Bristol City at the moment. And I'm not even sure if he plays. To be honest, I don't. Not to be arrogant about it, I just don't look at the Championship anymore. But um, yeah, it was good to good to see him there, and that um, I know that him and Grealish had a little um, cuddle, and uh, Stuart, the, the press manager, <laughs> said that they go, Jack. There's a <laughs> there's the good. Uh, Jack Grealish. Yeah, exactly. So that was a that was sort of a nice touch. That I mean, that was all the afters. But um, um, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it was funny, funny chant anyway. Four shots on target for Eli Adebayo this season. Four goals. Is he now the starting striker? Got to be, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, we've got to be consistent. We've we talked in earlier podcasts about how um, Carl Morris was doing the business and running the the lineup as a front man, a lone front man a lot of the time and doing a great job and holding it up. Yeah, not getting the goals he wanted, but he wasn't really getting the service either. Uh, and then Eli came on as an impact player and when he came on as an impact player, he was scoring goals. Um, and that's so far in the two games that Morris has had to sit on the bench and come on. That's not, he hasn't been able to do that. So Adebayo was well up for that game yesterday. He looked a huge threat. He was running the channels well. He, he nicked, nicked a couple of balls off toes uh, which you can't say that happened a lot of the time because they kept it so well and um, yeah he was direct and he ran against them and they didn't like it so um, you know if he can do that against Man City then surely he's got to be a starter for Bournemouth Yeah I would imagine so and um, well Eli was cock hoop with his goal after the game not so much uh, the result, of course, but well, James has been busy for the last couple of days. We've uh, sent we sent him down after the fu- uh, full time whistle to get Eli's thoughts on it, and um, well, the goal in particular, and here's what he had to say: another defeat, but you've obviously run the European champions so close. Uh, how do you assess it? Yeah, um, it was tough. It was it was tough. We knew it was going to be tough today, um, but we knew that if we if we got close and we were we were we caused chaos today. I think we people are gonna hopefully try and get something from the game. And again, we came so close, ran them close. Um you can see them bringing the defenders on at the end to try and obviously nullify the threat that we had. And uh the boys are flat in there, but so proud, proud of them. Um 
because of the work that we put in for large amounts of the game and we knew they were going to get chances um, and champions and, and uh, treble winners. So it was just about <clears throat> trying to stay in the game as long as possible and I think we did that and as the, as the game goes on and even though they're 2-1 up, we can hopefully sense that we we're going to get a chance at the end and unfortunately uh, we couldn't get it. But yeah, credit to the boys. Uh, it's been a tough week but we'll regroup again and we'll be back ready for Bournemouth away next week. Well, not like that. The 17 minutes, though, it was glorious. And that is because you scored right at the end of the first half. A wonderful header. I mean, you scored some big goals for Luton, but that one sounded massive for the reaction of the crowd. Yeah, I mean, to score in, in any game of football is 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 great. Um, and again, the champions to score against them is obviously a good personal, but... I probably would have preferred the points, um, even though a point. I think the boys deserved at least a point today, but it wasn't meant to be. Um, but even for me personally, just got to keep my head down and uh, keep going. And like I said, in there, uh, the, the points will come. We, we just got to keep sticking at it and keep learning as, as the weeks go by. And I'm, I'm sure we'll pick up some points along the way. I know obviously prefer the points, but on a personal level, that's two in two. Two fantastic headers um, now on the starting sheet as well. It must be uh, pleasing for you at the moment. Yeah, I mean, um, when you're not in the side, it's tough. You got to come on and try and try and affect the game in a positive way. Um, and for me, whether I'm starting off, I'm on the bench. It's about being positive in everything I do. Um, being out of the side again, it was tough. Those couple of weeks were tough, and the gaffers put me in. And I just hope that. Um, I've I've repaid him with with uh, two two goals in, in in a week, but like I said, I think we both me and the gaffer and everyone else probably would have preferred preferred the points. But I mean, we knew it was going to be tough um, playing Arsenal and Man City in the same week. It was definitely going to be tough, but um, so proud of the boys for how they went about the game um, for for large amounts of it. I mean, the two, arguably the two best teams in the country yeah. at the moment, random so close, just lost by the odd goal. Obviously, it was a signal against Arsenal. Yeah. But, um, you know, the, these guys have won the treble. They've swept it all before them. And um, I think everybody would, would, would was outside of it anyway, yeah. predicting that there might have been a big score. But, yeah. I mean, well, they've had to rely on sort of a, a mistake in the end, really, to, to, to win. Yeah. I mean, we... Yeah. Giving away soft goals at the moment, um, we know that we need to we need to cut that out. Um, but like I said about the learning thing, I think week on week we are going to learn, and hopefully those soft goals will um, essentially be be cut out, and then we'll start picking up some points. But like I said again, uh, the boys were were fantastic for large amounts of the game, and we know that we played again the, the two toughest teams um, in a week, and <clears throat> we came so close the other night was was heartbreaking um for us everyone was flattened there and we had to pick ourselves up again to come and, and try and put on another performance for today and i think i think everyone inside the stadium could feel that um until obviously they scored their goals and then we knew it was going to be tough but again still in the game uh right until the end and you, know, you just need that one chance to fall to to someone and and hopefully we could we, we could have taken it but it wasn't meant to be um We'll rest up, got another big week, important game next week, and uh, we'll be relishing the challenge again to try and get some points away from home. I suppose if you assess it logically, you can look at it like how, how good Arsenal and Man City are and how close you run them, but no team's going to really want to come here and play you when you've played that well against those two teams. And again, the, the, the gaffer said in there, you've got to take confidence from from this week. Um, we know that anyone comes here is is going to be in for a game. Um and we've got to try and make it as chaotic as possible. Um, and essentially, we are going to try and hurt teams as well. Yes, we, we, we play different ways in different games. But essentially, any team that comes here with the crowd and everyone up and everyone behind us, we know that this place is a tough place to come. And like I said, the points will come. Always a good, honest chat with Eli. You guaranteed that. And um, full credit to him. I mean... The one thing that you want from any player that's not in the team is to take the chance when they get it. And as you said before, we listen to him. He's fully taken it. Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, yeah, he's he, he talks a good game. I enjoy talking to you and I about football, um, particularly after that. I mean, he was, you know, he, 
he must have loved that goal. And like all of us, it's sort of the hope that gets you, doesn't it? And then you get it taken away from you in three second half minutes, really. But, um, you know, he, he, he put Luton in a position that would have frightened them a bit. I know that they'll come up and say that they thought they could still come out in the second half and, and win it. And that's fair enough. You wouldn't be the champions you are if you didn't have that confidence and swagger. But there's got to be a, there's got to be at least one thought in some in the back of somebody's mind that oh my god we're down to Luton here. Yeah, I mean, as I said right at the start, for 17 minutes of game time and 15 minutes of half time, that Eli goal had 10,000 of us in that stadium dreaming of what might have been. And you know, fair play, yeah complete fair play to Eli he's, he's definitely taken a chance and I'm pleased for Eli on Sunday because he didn't get no credit on Tuesday night because it was all our Raya this Raya that you know and the fact that he messed up well he might have messed up but Eli didn't miss his chance did he he still put the ball in the back of the net but no one seems to uh, have made anything of um, his run and his header in that game It's it was just Raya this Raya that so no um, taking that away from him on Sunday that was a purely brilliant header up above Ruben Diaz Thumped it in the corner, in the top corner, and uh, yeah, scenes that much like when Chong scored against Liverpool and when Barkley put his head against Arsenal. When we look back on this season, whatever happens, and we're definitely in their fight. In these three games, have shown that whatever happens, we're going to mem- remember these three moments for a long, long time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've got to give him credit for the finish as well, because um, maybe at the start of the season, he might have rushed that and tried to put too much on it. He didn't have to. The cross was that good. He just had to guide it uh, into the top corner. Um, and that's full credit to him. I, I, mean, I know he works on it in training and and, and he did so after um, that Tottenham game where he obviously missed that sitter. And he, uh, and he, he said, to, said to me that he's going to go back to the drawing board and start... Uh, trying to correct that and so I think they, I'm paraphrasing but yeah um, you, you can see from the two finishes the last two games that um, something's working there it certainly is the only problem was as much as we were dreaming in the back of your head you were like we've poked the bear here haven't we and um, so it proved but even then it took them 15 minutes to really get control of the second half they had one or two shots flying here there and everywhere Kaminsky makes an absolute blinder of a save from Ruben Diaz um, five or ten minutes into the second half pushes the shot onto the crossbar and I was pretty sure at the time that he did it even though I sit in the kennel end and that was in front of the Oak Road goal I was pretty sure he got a touch but then you see the replays on match of the day and things and he's definitely got a touch and that's a brilliant save but then <sighs> I wanted to avoid talking about referees in this game, but he's absolutely horrendous, that bloke. He was horrendous at the Stadium of Light uh, for the first leg of the playoffs last season. He was horrendous at the Hawthorns when Jordan Clark got wiped out by Sam Johnston a few seasons ago. How he's a Premier League referee, I have no idea. And in the lead up to the first goal, and it's a great finish. There's no taking away from the finish from Bernardo Silva, even though Rob Edwards, as you'll hear in a minute, thought it was Phil Foden. Mm-hmm. To, be, to be fair, Foden did everything else. So it's an, yeah, it's an easy assumption to make. Um, in the build up to it, Jacob Brown's taken out by Kyle Walker on the right hand side. He might have tracked the run of Bernardo Silva. And Rodri plows right through Tom Lockyer. Absolutely right through him. Tom Lockyer may have been in a position where he could have got something in the way of that. Uh, Bernardo Silva shot how that goes unnoticed by four officials that are there and then VAR that are looking in on that he's absolutely poleaxed him wiped him right out it's a foul but no I mean he may as well have wore a city shirt uh, on Saturday, on Sunday that referee he was absolutely terrible as always but you just want help in the big decisions and you just got to know the game Lockie could have thrown himself in front of that shot. It might still have hit him and flown in, or for for what we know, but he was denied the opportunity to do so. It has to be a foul. Yeah, I mean, you can see why people um, bang on about top team bias, really, don't you? When that happens, because um, arguably, where Bernardo Silva's firing that ball, maybe where Tom Lockie stands, he gets something on that, and, and nothing happens. So, you know, we've got it there for a reason. It's, I've I've not seen them really go over to VAR that many times in Kenilworth Thread. I mean, I'm struggling to think about it once now where they've gone over to the, the, the camera and used the screen, sorry, and used it. And But I, I, yeah, I guess that either the referees got to think that something was there or the people in, 
in Stockley Park have got to tell him it. And if they don't, what, what, what are they doing? I mean, we've seen this season, not in Luton games, but across the board, they've gone way, way back in moves to see if something's ruled out. And, and why not this one, really? Um, you know, it's hard to feel, hard not to feel hard done by in, in situations like that. I mean, you can't take any, anything away from the strike, but surely if it's there and it's being used to such pedantic levels in every other game, then why not there? Yeah, it's a peach of a strike from Bernardo Silva, as I say, but a lane is opened up for him to curl that because Tom Locke is wiped out by Rodri and he is wiped out. Lockyer wins the ball. Rodri plows right through him as he tries to make a challenge. Nothing doing. So we're aggrieved at that. And then three minutes later, well, everyone in the ground at the time convinced it was a handball. Is it? We've seen it all back now. Poor old Amari is about three inches from actually finding the bloke's hand, but he finds his chin instead with a misplaced pass. And Alvarez goes through and uh, I mean, it's a calamity of errors from there onwards, really, isn't it? Alvarez rolls the ball across. Poor old Ted Amengi doesn't know how to deal with it. Tries to swing a ball at her foot and just get something on it. Can't get anything on it. There's Grealish. Oh, no. You knew where it was going to end up. And then via going through Kaminsky's legs, it's in the bottom corner. And uh, obviously, huge boos going around the ground because we thought it was handball. Um, but a disappointing goal. I mean, everyone that you spoke to has mentioned soft goals counting against us. It's hard to be too critical because it's £105 million pounds worth of, of of a player who scored the winner on Tuesday night, £100 million pound on Sunday. Maybe they make them look a little bit soft, but that one in particular, when you look at it back, you're like, oh, why can't someone have got a toe on it somewhere along the line? Yeah, it's difficult to watch back. And um, yeah, I know people are looking at Bell for that, for that and... It, he didn't look comfortable receiving the ball in there, but I mean, City do do that to people. There was three of them pressing and they do do that to people. I, I guess he's got to have been, maybe a bit more conviction aware about where he's passing it up, where he's putting the ball and maybe it doesn't, it doesn't hit Alvarez that way. And I, I must admit, I thought it was handball to start with. I did have the benefit of replays soon after and uh, one looked like, it was a handball, but then you got a more conclusive angle, which I think everybody's probably seen by now, and it does definitely hit him in the chin. But I don't think you can put that all on Bell's shoulders because that happens in the centre of the park. They then go down the, the wing and, and the ball finds its way across the box to Grealish. Um, I'm not sure what, I'm not sure what Ted and Mengi's doing there. He's got his legs all tangled up because I think he's been fantastic, Ted and Mengi. They take nothing away from him. And he was good in that game as well. It's just... You look at it and you go, well, I'm not sure what he's trying to do there with his legs. And um, any sort of nick, and then it probably avoids Grealish and goes out for a corner. And um, either he's got caught in two minds or he's gone with the wrong leg or something. I don't know how it gets to Grealish. And then obviously he gets it, he gets it and it goes through Kaminsky's legs. And it's just, you know, how's your luck then? Because Kaminsky's had a blinder or. Oh, that game he's had a blinder all season to be honest and he must be wondering how the hell have I not got a clean sheet because he's pulled off some stunning saves and that one happens and you know bar it not being in the very last kick of the game it was every bit as a sickener uh, as Arsenal really I know you've got a lot of time to try and rectify the situation and Luton had a good go towards the end but Man City aren't going to concede that many goals, really. Um, and Luton didn't have that many chances either. I mean, so um, you sort of saw the writing on the wall. I mean, I didn't expect that they'd go t uh, trying to see out the game in the corner flag, mind you. But, um, you know, that's uh, that's the Luton effect, maybe. Yeah, well, that's the positive that you could take from it, isn't it? The, the team that won everything last season not only run the ball into the corner in injury time, but they've got six defenders on the pitch at the end once a Kanji comes on for Foden. Mm. This is against little old Luton, you know. That's not the way that it's expected to be. Uh, you're right. Yeah. The game didn't fizzle out after their second goal because we tried as hard as we could, but the golfing class was evident. And also the players that they were bringing off the bench. I mean, Manuel Akanji, Switzerland international, copious others. Um that are recognisable that come off the off the bench for them as well. I mean, even Nunes, they just signed in for fifty million from Wolves, didn't they? And he only come he only gets five minutes for him. It's like that's what we're up against, and that's fine. We know that. Apart from that Barkley shot, 
re- Edison really didn't have too much trouble. But, you know, we've given everything that we've got in these two games. Come up short in both of them. Probably deserved at least two points, if not more, from these two games. But it was comp- it was compounded by every other team around us getting results for the second match day in a row. Uh, and it's making it making the situation look a little bleaker, isn't it? It is for now, it is for this week, and you know, you can understand people feeling that way, but I think um you've got to look at the long game and how Luton are performing really, and if they can do that against Arsenal or Man City, and they've played really the top boys now at, at Kenworth Road. Um we haven't got another one for I think it was then ten games. Yeah, if you think that um the top four in any order this season are Man City, Arsenal, Liverpool and Tottenham as the bookmakers do. You've now got 10 games until we go to Liverpool. Um, So you're looking at this is our crunch period of the season. And if you want to flip it around and you go back to what we said at the start of the season, whereby home form is going to keep us up. Again, if they're your top four, they've all been and gone now. So we've got 11 home games left. Okay, some people will say what about Aston Villa? And that's absolutely fair enough. But the deeper they go into Europe this season, and they are going to go deep into Europe, you would imagine they're going to come off the top of their form. And Unai Emery lives for European titles doesn't he so he's not going to sack that off we've got 11 home games now so let's say in those 11 home games you can pick up or the target has to be to pick up sort of 18 to 20 points as a bare minimum that gets you onto 27 or 29 you're kind of if you if you would achieve that you see you're looking at what six home wins in that period if you can achieve that then you're looking at picking up somewhere in the vicinity of six to eight points away from home. Bearing in mind, we have to go to Burnley, we have to go to Sheffield United, and we will preview later this week a trip to Bournemouth. All of a sudden, you can see it's doable. Yeah, I mean, I don't don't lose hope at the moment. I mean, I know it when you look at the table and you think four points adrift and certainly Everton aren't going to be knocking around the lower reaches of that division for very long the way they're going. But there's other teams that can come into it. Obviously, everybody's looking at Forest and... Uh, and Palace at the moment and that, that'll ebb and flow and maybe some other teams that join that or come out of it um, I think the, it, it's difficult I, I guess if you're looking at if you're only purely looking at results if you're um, if you're not getting to all the games and you're not seeing what's unfolding for the you know right in front of your eyes for the full 1996 97 what it is sometimes it, it, I can see that it would be a, easily easy to get discouraged but you know it's it's not wrong what Edwards is saying about the performances are great the narrative is changing all that that's absolutely right I think it is Luton are going to have a lot more respect on their name now after what they've done this week even though they haven't got a point um, and we and to all intents and purposes nobody was expecting them to get one so to come so close against Arsenal so bloody close and then for a little brief glorious period of football leads the best team in the world how how can you not take that as a as a confidence boost when you're going into with respect lesser teams yeah i mean it's not just with respect is it the league table tells you that the lesser teams um you know 10 games now as i say until liverpool away this is the you know we all looked at december and we we're like Christ alive but now we're looking at these 10 games and they they are big. I mean, even those two home games to come against Newcastle and Chelsea, it looks like they, they travel somewhere other than the games they're meant to be at because <laughs> their away form's shocking. And of course, we hope that that's the case over Christmas and we'll need it to be the case. We'll need to make it uh, be the case over Christmas. But you're absolutely right. There is perspective in all of this. If we can take Arsenal and Man City close, we can win six home games. And that that has to be... I mean, if we win more than six home games, happy days. But we have to find six six more home wins to keep us in the Premier League. And the, the good thing is, well, I think you've got to look at that. Luton are scoring goals as well. I mean, yes, they're con- conceding. But if they can s- stop that, cut out the silly mistakes, the goals are there because all the forwards are scoring. And so that's a positive. Add into the fact that uh, Samuel Lekonga is back now as well. So arguably, if we're going by what Edwards was saying when... Sambi first signed there's du- the double pivot possibilities between them and marvellous you and I are both thinking Barkley gets more f- forward there and is given even more freedom and if Luton are playing this way 
when he's a six, what are they going to be like if he's a 10? And so the possibilities that are there to, to go and, you know, win those games, it's, it's, it's very possible. You know, if you, if you're just looking at the cold light of the Monday morning after the, the, the game before, um, I can't imagine there isn't anybody that was in that ground in that ground that wasn't proud of how Luton played. Um, but I know some people are looking at the results as well. And of course, of course you will, we will be, but in the fuller picture of it, um, they're not done yet. No, not by a long chalk. And Rob Edwards reflected on that in his post-match press conference, proud, proud manager, but still appreciates the bigger picture. And we sent James along to get his thoughts after the game. Yeah. Proud, proud of them. Um, I'm disappointed. I am disappointed as well today. Uh, felt, um, I felt like it was there for us today. A really good feeling going into the game. It's with all, you know, complete respect for Manchester City and and and, the, and what they are and who they are. And they, you know, credit to them for for winning the game. I just felt it. And then when we're going in at the time of the goal, uh, uh, you know, just before half time, um, I felt. And this could be our day, but look, we're disappointed with the goals that we conceded. Um, but um, we'll look at that and we've got to keep working on that and improving. But I thought we were so brave. I thought, you know, without the ball being as aggressive as we were against a top team like that, there's a lot of problems that for them to solve, which they're capable of doing. Um, but I thought with the ball, again, really brave and showed a lot of quality as well. And I thought the goal was a really good example of that. We were brave. We tried to take the ball when we could. We knew we couldn't just go. You know, we could not just give the ball back to Manchester City, otherwise you die a slow death. And um, yeah, everything about my team today, I really, really liked. My job is to concentrate on performances. Um, unfortunately, we can't control the wins, the draws, the losses. If I could, you know, I'd be a very wealthy man. I'd be selling that. Um, I've got to try and, you know, my, my thing, the thing that keeps me up at night, my main concern is the performance of the team. And if we continue to perform the way we have this week, then, you know, we can we can achieve something really, really special this year. We, again, we know how tough this is going to be. We know the fight that we're in, but I like the way the team's going. I love the I love the spirit of the team. I love, I love how hard they're working for the football club, for each other. Um, but I love the quality that they're showing as well. You know, and I think, I think maybe we're starting to change the narrative a little bit about Luton Town Football Club, but... That being said, I know we ultimately we need to pick up the points. I think in the cold light of day, again, the lads will be, be able to reflect and be proud of themselves and again, take confidence and belief from it. But yeah, like, like we were in midweek against Arsenal, they're flat in there and, 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 and down because we challenge them. We go into every game. We really do believe in that we can get something from the game. And we have to. If we don't, then we're going to be struggling, you know. And uh, you know, the players pick themselves up after the Arsenal game. Um, recovered well, trained well, taken on the messages. You obviously then have a, a, a different proposition in Manchester City and they're able to then implement another game plan. Um, you know, I'm so proud of the lads. And, and they will take a lot of confidence and belief in that, but they're hurting right now. Goals are, goals are things that change games, those moments. You know, we limited them to fairly little big chances, I think, as well today. And that's credit to the players. I'm not sure. I think it's a pretty... First goal for Foden's finish is, is brilliant. I'm not even sure that's a big chance, really. You know, it's just really well taken by an excellent football. And um, yeah, for him to get that second one so quickly, it just it just probably knocked the stuffing out of us, the wind out of us for a little bit. But I thought we regained our composure and grew into the game again. And then we were pressing. We were a team that we were really pressing towards the end, which again, you know, after such a hard week physically and mentally, I deserve a lot of credit for that. Honest from the boss, uh, it's a little bit concerning that he says that he's having sleepless nights, worrying about performances and things like that. Don't, Rob, we'll be absolutely fine. Just keep doing what we're doing and we're uh, and we're on it. Uh, James was busy. Not just did he catch up with Rob Edwards, he also caught up with two other heroes, if you like, from the game, uh, Marvellous Nakamba and Jacob Brown, and here's what they had to say. We should just say before we play this audio, all of these player interviews after the game is done in the mixed zone. And if you've been to the inner sanctums of Kenworth Road, you'll know there's not enough room to swing a guinea pig around, let alone a cat. <laughs> not that we advocate swinging animals around, just a metaphoric 
figure of speech. Uh, so there is some background noise in all of this. Players are around with their families. Equipment's being wheeled out and everything else. The boys do their best to uh, keep all the background noise to a minimum, but you will pick some up here. But we hope you can still get the gist of what the lads said. Uh, I think difficult to take, but unfortunately, almost it was same way like against Arsenal and today also. But the positive thing, I think, to go toe to toe with one of the best teams, it just to give us more encouragement and positive thing to go out of to go into our next game. What is always good to play against the PSC. We have played against them also before in Champion League when you see the perfect game. I don't, you know, all the quality and everything, but today, to go close toe to toe with them. Um, this is what we want. This is what we wanted the club to be in the Premier League. So we just have to keep on giving everything, fighting everything. The fans, I think, are really 100% behind us. It's up to us now to push more, maybe a little bit more excellent. First good goal for my I was delighted for him and also for the club, for our fans. And it was a good time when you get the goal. Uh, unfortunately, on the second half, and to proceed, two goals, pick goals in space of five minutes. Of course, at the end also, we keep on pushing, but it didn't happen. But I just you have to keep on believing and encourage each other for more positive thing. But it's only a matter of time. Hopefully soon, we'll be winning games. I think the club as players, the fans, I think the confidence is still there. I think with the performance that we are putting on, the confidence has to be there from each and every one inside the club. And also, uh, me personally as a player, I still believe, I'm a believer, and hopefully soon we'll get some points. We can all be um, proud of the performance, but again, it's just it's disappointing to come away with nothing from the game. Um, but we just got to obviously move on to the next lot of games and, and just be positive with obviously the performances we've put out against two top sides. And only because about the odd goal, and then obviously the last one, the last bloody second. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's heartbreaking on one hand, but some people you can probably take into the rest of the season, is it? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, we'd we'd rather perform like that and show that we we can obviously compete against these top teams. But it's just like so frustrating because we're playing really well, but maybe like conceding goals that that we can probably um, stop. Last question. Like they're not um, they're not like carving through us and goals that we just can't do anything about, but we. We can probably maybe switch on a, a little bit more or just get tighter to our men, but it's, it's something that we're working on. And um, yeah, again, it's it's two top sides, so we've got to probably try and take the positives from it, which there are there are a lot. Talk to me about that goal. I've I've seen a picture of you celebrating. You're on your knees. I, I must, I, the noise was unbelievable. Yeah. It's uh, incredible scenes. Yeah, it was it was just just relief because I thought we played so well in the first half, and it's sometimes we don't always get what we deserve. Whereas there. To get that goal just before half time, like, we deserved it and it was such a good feeling. Um, I think I was just tired as well. I like, <laughs> just dropped to my knees. Um, but yeah, we again, we went in at half time, leading, and we just, like, again, in games in the future, need to, to work on that and go out and get the next goal. I don't think I've seen a team have the ball as much as Man City, and obviously we knew that, that was going to happen. But what's it like as an opposition player? having to run around after that and chasing shadows sometimes but you've got to do the work yeah it's tough um, like we knew it was going to be like that um, and obviously having the game against Arsenal probably like prepared us for that um, but you just can't switch off at all um, which I think we, we did well for the majority of the game um, but yeah if, if one of your teammates is out of position like you just got to fill in for them uh, and we knew that we all, we all worked so hard today and um, it's just disappointing that we, we came over with nothing yep Honest interviews from both of them. I mean, Jacob Brown seems to be loving it, doesn't he? I mean, and why wouldn't he be loving it? He's playing in the Premier League. He's scoring goals in the Premier League. He's having a major impact in games in the Premier League. And he was all of us when he like went in. It was When that goal went in, he was all of us on the knees just cheering. And it's brilliant scenes. Yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> it was a good... I've got that as a picture. It's, um, it's a great uh, celebration that... Uh, and- then obviously jumping on the back of uh, Eli. It's got to be the best celebration for a goal that the player hasn't scored yeah. ever, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it was absolutely wonderful. And I, I thought he had such a great game. He he was outstanding. He, um, when you're playing against City, and, and Rob talked about it, that you've got to try and do something when you get the ball because you ain't going to see a lot of it. And when he did get the ball, he held it out. He... Um, and he looked positive and he, he he got his head up and he moved, tried to move forward with the ball. And, you know, if, whether that's beating a player or or, or finding another one, he, he did his role fantastically well. I thought he, in the first half, especially, um, you know, if you take out Kaminsky, um, 
who's going to be in a shout for man of the match for most games, I would imagine. Him and Adebayo were leading that line fantastically. Um, uh, you know, it gave gave City something to think about. Yeah, it did. And he was also the only one who got near Phil Foden over the course of the afternoon. OK, that he was very lucky to stay on the pitch with the tackle. Thankfully, he didn't catch Foden as strongly as he could have done. Um, and once I- it went to VAR, I think, I mean... We, we didn't see it at the time, but we, now that we've seen it back, once it's gone to VAR, if you're seeing that, if you're sat at home watching that, you're kind of like, uh-oh, he's going to get sent off here. I don't think there was any malice in it. It was just the only way he could get anywhere near him was to jump in and um, thankfully he survived. Yeah, I mean, it was a striker's tackle, <laughs> wasn't it? Totally. But yeah, he didn't connect. And I think that that's probably why he didn't get sent off because if he does any sort of connection there, then then you get your marching orders. And so maybe him putting in a striker's tackle, which didn't actually touch him, probably benefited then. I mean, that would have been harsh on him for his performance, but then, you know, back to the wall for Luton, really, um, for the last period of that game, as it turns out that Luton were able to, you know, throw the kitchen sink at him, relatively speaking. Um, you know, obviously it didn't come to anything in the end, but, uh, you know, it, that's another thing, um, you know, if we're talking about positive uh, positive things. Luton's fitness is incredible because <laughs> they are going to the end of these games. And yeah, and you can point to Liverpool and Arsenal where they've conceded, but they are well in those games. And um, against City, obviously trying to force an equaliser at the end, you know, with, with not really getting close, but trying their their damnedest to do it. Um, the conditioning work into those players to be up to this Premier League standard is is phenomenal. Yeah, it is. You're absolutely right. A couple of other positives that I want to focus on. Andros Townsend. Now, if you think of Ross Barkley's progression this season, needed a few games to get going. And, he's, you know, he's, he, if he's a car, he's, he's going naught to 60 at a, you know, normal, you know, a consistent speed, isn't he? Townsend's getting to 60 now, isn't he? You know, he's... Not just his pass, uh, sorry, his cross for the goal on Sunday, his pass to Barkley on Tuesday, his awareness, probably hasn't got the pace. And that's why it's important that Kabore is on his outside rather than Doughty, who is always going to cut in because he's all left footed, as we saw uh, the last time that uh, Doughty played that right back role at, uh, against Crystal Palace. But what he has got is he's clever. He's got a good first touch, he holds on to the ball. He's got experience. He's got a bit of class about him. I did see a post on social media after the Arsenal game. Someone said they don't know what he brings to the team. Well, open the eyes and <laughs> watch him and you'll soon find out what he brings to the team. He brings class to the team and um, he's, get, he's, he's, he's like Barkley, isn't he? He's obviously six or seven games behind Barkley, but he's getting there now. He's making that impact that we want him to make. Yeah, absolutely. You only have to look at the cross for, for the goal. I mean, that, that's a that's a one track mind of knowing what the right thing to do there is. There's no second guessing about it. He, he creates the space and he whips it into the danger area. Not only that, he does it with quality, uh, and that's what you get from a player that's spent his life in the Premier League, really. So, um, yeah, no, I didn't see that post. That's that is a bizarre take, to be quite honest. To whoever put that one, I think. Um, you know, he, what he does give to the team is the experience of um, calmness and keeping the ball in tight situations, whether that's being closed down or, um, you know, tough, tense moments. Um, he, he can do that. And he's certainly an outlet ball as well down the wing. I mean, yeah, maybe he hasn't got the pace he once had, but he's still fairly quick. Um, so... Yeah, he's, um, you know, it's, he's, he's everything that we thought in the same mould as Barkley as if he can get some minutes and get back to how he probably was in his pump, anywhere close to it, let's say, then, you know, for the peanuts he's probably costing. It's a great investment. Yeah, it is. And as I've said on this podcast a few other times in the past, he's given plenty off the pitch as well as on the pitch, not just to players in the first team, but I've seen it with my own eyes, what he brings to the academy players who look up to him, who pick his brains, 
if you go into the academy game on Tuesday night, then you'll see a couple of the sort of proteges that he's sort of mentoring, and um, the improvement in them is is untrue as well. So, yeah, what he brings is fantastic, and we're all expecting him to be here till the end of the season, and that be confirmed in the coming days. And when it is, I think we'll all be delighted. Yeah, I I, th- I think so because um, when when you when they're all fit and when they're all on the same pitch and potentially this can happen, a midfield of Marv, Lukonga, Barkley and Andros Townsend is Premier League experience, quality and a handful of players that are absolutely playing to their maximum. And that's all you need. That's all, that's all you can ask for. And it it is a different world from what we're used to. But if you can't see the quality in here, then I'm... <laughs> I'm not sure that you're cut out for watching top flight football, maybe. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. I mean, I can't wait to watch that midfield. It's going to be yeah, fantastic. As we said a few times, actually. Um, the other positive that I want to talk about, we Ryan Giles had a lot of criticism, didn't he? Or, or rather the decision not to play Ryan Giles at Brentford. It was put forward that he was seen as more of a winger. And since then he's come on twice at wing back. And, mm. um, but when you consider, you know, he's up against Bernardo Silva, uh, on Sunday and you know when he came on the other day he was up against Saka he's been fine hasn't he the only thing you would say is maybe he hasn't contributed as much in the offensive area of the pitch as he would have been expected to but I mean you've got to put on to that that we're playing against Arsenal and Manchester City it's you know it's not easy to just get down there and whip crosses in you've got to have a kind of a structure to it and as I mentioned earlier it was very clear that their left back was significantly weaker than their right back but I thought Giles was fine on Sunday yeah no no qualms with him whatsoever really did a solid job if not outstanding solid um I can't remember too many times where he had the opportunities to cross um and obviously that's his forte uh, and that's what he's been he's been signed for but well, that will come. I mean, you're talking, you're talking about the European champions. I mean, they, they, they are that for a reason. I mean, they can not only score a hell of a lot of goals at one end, but they can keep them out. So, um, you know, particularly down the flanks as well. I mean, I, I know you pointed out the fullback there, but on the other side, they've got Carl Walker. So he's fairly confident and nobody's running past him. <laughs> he, although he's probably glad that Chia wasn't playing in that game. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's good that he's got a, a run now, a couple of games, and, you know, depending on how long Chia is out, because we don't know yet, then then the opportunities are probably going to be there for him uh, a bit more. Uh, so it's it's sort of a, a wait-and-see scenario with with Giles. But, um, yeah, you can't say that it's a squad game and not use him. So now he's been used and you, you, can, you can sort of take away that um that that question i guess indeed yeah that's fair enough one negative from the afternoon and you feared it as soon as you saw marvelous nick amber's name on the team sheet you feared it please whatever you do please don't pick up that fifth yellow card bournemouth is much more important than manchester city Uh, i've seen players walk off with the football many times this season right not a yellow card this pillar comes to town and books him straight away. And if you booked Barkley for the tackle, not that I thought it was a bad tackle or anything like that, then fair enough. He wasn't even walking away. He was standing there with the ball. If they're that desperate to get on with it, someone go and get it off of him. You saw this with Jordan Ayew on on Saturday as well, when Van Dijk tried to belt the ball into him, but he got out of the way and he got a yellow card. Just have a word first. And if he does it and keeps on doing it, then book him. But he didn't. That was the first time. And it's, it's annoying. Well, it's, a, it's a nonsense rule. If it, if, if it even is, it, or if it's an interpretation of a, of a law, I don't know, who knows anymore. It's just, um, do we really need to see that many yellow cards? I mean, I don't want to harp on about how football was from back in the day, but yellow cards were for serious, serious fouls. And now you're just like tripping a player up and you get any yellow card for some circumstances and not even like a cynical foul half the time. You, If you've watched football long enough, maybe even if you've watched football for a short period, you can probably identify when a, 
a tackle has malice in it or, or, or a challenge or an infringement, whatever it is, has, um, you know, n- nefarious means behind it. And that, those sorts of things, the, the two examples that you've, you've said there, was, you know, can't see that that's a yellow card, not, not for me. And, you know, it goes back to why are you giving yellow cards for people celebrating goals in particular ways and stop trying to take the joy out of football, basically. Well, that's it. I mean, we said it many a time, we're paying top dollar to watch footballers here. And if I'm missing watching one of Luton's best footballers on Saturday, which I am now, because he had the audacity to order onto football, he did not go away with it. He was stood still. If they wanted it off of him, they could have quite easily gone and got it off of him. Fair enough, if he was running 50 yards away with it, then that's a completely different story. That was not what happened. And now we've got to miss, um, not just Luton missing a key player, but we're all paying 30, 30 quid to go down to Bournemouth, those of us that are lucky enough to get a ticket. And we're missing out seeing one of the best players in our team. And it's it's just all for uh, annoying things. And actually, you know, Arteta was in the stands on Saturday, wasn't he? What was his crime on Tuesday night? Celebrating a goal. I mean, come off of it. Where can he go at Kenilworth Road, which doesn't include cr- encroaching on the pitch? As soon as you leave your seat in the dugout, you're pretty much on the pitch. What's he supposed to do? Sit on his hands and like crawl under the seat or something? I mean, Jesus Christ, help us out. He didn't incite the crowd. No. I don't think any Luton fan, either in the Bobbers or anywhere in that stand, thought Arteta was disrespectful the other night. And then he sat in the stands on sun- on Saturday. I'm not an Arteta fan. And obviously he's dis- uh, misdemeanors beforehand. He deserved two yellow cards, but give me a break. They've just scored a 97th minute winner in a game that they haven't dominated at any stage they're going for the title just have a word with the bloke you don't have to brandish cards all the time no and Edwards was asked about that after the the Arsenal game about you know would you make of it and his his reaction was completely the right one it's like well I would have got booked as well then because I'd have celebrated if it was me it's that, that's the natural reaction that's what should happen football was about those moments even though we felt despair at that moment for Arsenal, it was the the the, the right reaction, and, and there was no, there was nothing in that. I mean, there was more probably yesterday. There's a little clip of Pep going around. Don't know what he's doing. Maybe kissing, doing a kissing gestures towards. I don't know. If it's to the bench or whatever. To the fourth official, wasn't it? He was. Yeah, yeah he was upset that I think Adebayo scored forty seven oh one, didn't he? And he wanted the whistle bang on forty seven. Could have done well, with you yeah. channeling our cause yeah. on Tuesday <laughs> night, Pep. So. Uh, that wasn't true, though, was it? He scored it a couple of seconds before. Yeah, well, he before the two minutes. It obviously up. took him three seconds to look up at the scoreboard. Yeah, so um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's just a nonsense. These things they, they they ruin they ruin the game because obviously Marv probably has to temper how he's behaving. Um, behaving's the wrong word. How he's playing, and then it it ruins the next game because he he can't. You can't play. You can't even appeal the situation. I mean, the fact that good it would do if you could, because they'll just throw the letter of the law at you, isn't it? But there's there's the spirit of the game, isn't there? That's got to come into it, and it's, it seems to be that that doesn't even come into the equation anymore. The the spirit of the game. Edison took an awful lot longer to take goal kicks than marvellous Nakamba was stood there with that ball for, and there was absolutely nothing for him. Two other quick quips before um, we're done. Great to see Sambi Lukonga back on the pitch. We're all looking forward to seeing him regularly in a Luton shirt. Probably brought about by the fact that Marv's not going to play on Saturday, so his hand was probably slightly forced. Didn't have a major impact in it, but he's another one who, when the ball comes to him, you feel confident that he's keeping it and we can move forward with him. Yeah, we didn't have a lot of football before he came the, um, when he first signed and he played those two games and everybody thought he was fantastic on the ball and quite promising. Simple stuff, but, you know, not a lot of people, if everybody could do it, they would and they, they, they can't. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing him play and I think you're right, he probably got more minutes against City because of that situation, knowing that he might have to play at, play at Bournemouth or, or at least, you know, give him 60 minutes or something like that. Um they're all incredibly fit though. We can't talk about strength and conditioning of the rest of the squad if uh, and not give it to him. If he's if he's ready to be in the squad, he's he'll be up there near enough fitness wise that you you would have thought. So yeah, yeah, good to see him back, and um, I hope he has a an impact. And obviously, he plays more than two games this time. Fingers crossed. Yep, and a billion pounds. It buys you an awful lot of trophies. 
an awful lot of FFP charges, mm-hmm. but it doesn't buy you a throw-in taker, does it? <laughs> I mean, Jesus Christ. He gave two foul throws. He could have given 22 foul throws. Put the ball behind your head, look for where you're throwing it, and then throw it. It's not difficult. No, there is a clip of him getting uh, pulled up for a foul throw when it wasn't. Uh, but I, I'm pretty sure I saw with my naked eye in that game a number of ones where it looked a bit iffy. So, um, yeah, I mean, you got, you got to laugh where you can, really. And, uh, you know, for a side of their quality, pulling off uh, consistent Sunday league moves was quite amusing, really. <laughs> Yeah, we might be a little old loot and we might not be taking the league seriously, but at least we can take a bloody throw in. And um, there you go. Uh, It's an afternoon of what might have been very much in keeping with Tuesday night, but we've led Liverpool, we've led Arsenal, we've led Manchester City. Okay, we haven't held on to all three of them. We've only held on, well, you know, we only got a point out of them. There ain't going to be many teams this season, top or bottom, who are going to have led them three teams in the space of a month. And um, that has to be a positive. There really is plenty of things to be positive about. Now is the time to go and get those results. We've kind of served our apprenticeship in this league. We've taken on the best of them. Now we're up against the second and third tier in the Premier League and we've got to make it count. And um, and that's on us now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, you only have to look at the weekend, Liverpool, went and scored a late goal against Crystal Palace. These teams do this to everybody and that's why they are where they are and where they finish as high as they do because they are able to affect games uh, even with the last kick of it. And um, there's absolutely no shame in anything that Luton have done against those teams. I think at the start of the season, we probably would have all been fearing an absolute hammering. Because, I mean, even Edwards has talked about it. At some stage, you might get a bit of a hammering. But so far, four goals is the worst it's got, really. And that was... um, uh, early stage really so um, you know they're, they're well in it they're competing they're scoring goals they just need to cut out the silly mistakes um, and then you know and arguably they're going to be they're going to be against quality and every every team's going to have the quality but they're not going to have Man City quality they're not going to have Liverpool and Arsenal quality so um, there might be a bit more leeway there but um, there's, there's there is still a lot of positives to take from it yeah, there is. The last two winning goal scorers against Luton Town have both cost their clubs £100 million or more. There's nothing else in the £100 million bracket to come other than all those defensive midfielders Chelsea have signed. And you'd be kind of disappointed if a defensive midfielder does that. Um, so yeah, no, plenty plenty to be positive about. Plenty to be uh, good about with, with perspective and the bigger picture and you know in many ways our season starts on Saturday with these 10 games that we've got coming up and um, who knows hopefully we get some points on the board we've just seen it everyone's saying Everton and Bournemouth are out of danger all they've done is won three games we can put three wins together all of a sudden we're back in it that is it for this episode of the Luton Town Supporters Trust podcast before I do all of the closing things both myself and James had people come up to us Uh, over the weekend uh, congratulating us and thanking us for the podcast and everything and we thank you as we did at the time because it's your comments your interactions that keep it going that's what it's all about so thank you very much for that thank you for everyone who listened or watched the podcast however it is that you consumed it thank you to the Hightown Club for staging the podcast to Sean Grant and the Wolfgang for the intro music and to Ed Smith Creative for all the designs on set James, thanks very much for keeping me company for the last hour or so. And until the Bournemouth preview, which will be out later in the week, come on, you hatters. You know what I love about this town is actually you. Everyone in it has got this massive soul. We're Luton people. 